So as we said last week, uh, we're added a final message to the series that we've been in. A, it's been a six-part series on heaven called Heaven, All That, and more. And today we're going to conclude it by talking about hell. And uh, the staff and uh, many of you have had lots of fun trying to give me suggestions for titles to today's sermon. Uh, some of my favorites have been uh, Give Them Hell Mac, and I like that one pretty good. Uh, All Hell Breaks Loose, that was one suggestion. Uh, one was Hell Yeah, I mean no, I mean no. And uh, uh, maybe my favorite was What The, and just leave it at that, and you uh, get, to fill in, uh, get to fill in the blank. David Bush, sitting over here, my friend David Bush recommended I just take Jonathan Edwards' great sermon called uh, Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God, preached in uh, 1741, that set in motion the Great Awakening. He just said, well, just, just read that. So I thought what I would do is just read you a little snippet from that sermon, okay? You ready? It says, he said, he preached, the God that holds you over the pit of hell much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, his wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. You have offended him infinitely more than ever a stubborn rebel did his prince. And yet tis nothing but his hand that holds you from falling into the fire every moment. Tis to be ascribed to nothing else that you did not go to hell last night that you were suffered to awake again in this world after you closed your eyes to sleep. And there is no other reason to be given why you have not dropped into hell since you arose this morning, but that God's hand has held you up. There is no other reason to be given why you haven't gone to hell since you sat here in the house of God, provoking his pure wrath, his eyes by your sinful, wicked manner of attending his solemn worship. Yea, there is nothing else that is to be given as a reason why you don't this very moment drop down into hell. There you go. There you go. Some of you have not heard preaching like that ever. Some of you have not heard preaching like that since you went to church with grandma when you were a kid. And let's be honest, I'm just going to venture to say some of you need some preaching like that, right? So again, though, this topic, like heaven, which most of us haven't heard lots of teaching on through the years, the same is true with hell. We talk a lot about it, but generally we don't know a lot about it. So of course, you know, today is just a cursory big picture, 30,000 from 30,000 foot look at, uh, at hell in a 40 or so minute sermon. But I want to start with a fundamental foundational building block uh, of Christian faith. Uh, to, to start us today. It's found in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, many of you will know this, some of you perhaps not, but, but uh, Paul is the writer in Ephesians chapter 2, and I thought, why don't, why don't we read this together, okay? So they're going to put it up on the screen. It's Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 8, and there God's Word says this. You ready? Join me. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now take a look again, the seventh word in that sentence, the word saved. We use the word saved a lot in, 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 in church. Salvation means to rescue or to deliver. The, the word picture of it is, is the idea of moving in and swooping up someone from some kind of perilous situation. And as Christians, we think of salvation as being saved to eternal life, saved to God, saved to heaven, and, and indeed it is. But whenever you're saved, before you're saved to something, you are saved from something. And the something that God offers salvation from is hell, the eternal destination and destruction of those who were judged by God for their sins and their rebellion against him. Now, we've spent the last six Sundays looking at what? Looking at what by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ that we are saved to. Paul calls it the gift of God. We are saved to the gift of God, a redeemed earth in resurrected bodies in the presence of God and in the absence of sin and its effects. 
Today we're talking about hell, the place of God's eternal judgment that we are or we can be saved from. A church, right? Here's, here's what I know. Here's what we all know. We live in the 21st century, and, and, and many modern people, for them, the topic of hell has kind of fallen out of favor. They refuse to believe that God's righteous wrath would be poured out against sinful man and that man would be punished for eternity. And so for a lot of people and a lot of Christians, a lot of churches, they don't want to think about hell or mention hell or have the preacher preach about hell. Simply too uncomfortable. And there are many pastors, many preachers who will readily admit that they don't preach about hell for those same reasons. It's only God's love, God's love, God's love. We live in an era of, of creating one's own truth. And especially when it comes to, to God, projecting onto God what we want God to be like, what we want him to do, what we want him to, to, to believe, how God should do things. But much of today's preaching offers Jesus salvation, even. This is an example uh, from a host of problems psychological problems, material problems. The, the promise of, of, of much preaching will be Jesus wants to save you from loneliness. He wants to save you from purposelessness. He wants to save you from anxiety or poverty or oppression or sickness or disappointment. And the truth is, when Jesus comes into your life, Jesus brings healing and recovery of many of the maladies of life. He can change many, many of those things. But Jesus' love for man and his death on the cross was not to save you from your problems, psychologically or materially. His death on the cross was to save you from hell, from a miserable eternal punishment and separation from God. Let's call it this. Let's, let's give it a name, okay? Okay. I think of it as the problem of hell. The modern-day church era, the problem of hell. It's just a problem. Talk of hell, of God's wrath, of God's judgment, of his punishment of sin, of, of eternal separation from God, of a conscious torment. That's just, a, that's just a problem for many. And honestly, I understand the root cause. I, I don't like the concept of hell either. I don't want to die and go to hell. I don't want anyone to die and go to hell. How many of you, how many of you know the name or remember the name Rob Bell? Some of you know him from, uh, from the past. Most recently, he was known for being Oprah Winfrey's pastor. And that should be a red flag if you, know, uh, if you know her theology. But Rob Bell was once an up-and-coming star in the evangelical world. In the late 1900s, early 2000s, he pastored a very, very large church. Rob was a outside-the-box thinker, had some really good ideas. And, and, but probably, at, at least for me, the, the thing that I ad, admired most about Rob was that he genuinely had a heart for people who felt far away from God, the marginalized, the overlooked, the people who felt hurt by the church. Like he, the, you know, the people that, that were on the outside looking in. And, and Rob really wanted to con connect those people to God. And I admire that in a person. I share the same feelings. But over time, Rob kept moving from truth and moving away from sound doctrine. And in 2011, he wrote a best-selling book called Love Wins. The full title of the book is Love Wins, a book about heaven, hell, and the fate of every person who ever lived. And essentially, the book set out to, to answer this question. And, and it's a question that I would imagine most of us have wrestled with, thought about, had some tension over. But the question is simply this. Does a loving God really send people to hell for eternity? Could he do that? Can he do that? And, and, and again, haven't you wondered about that? Haven't you felt the, the, the rub in that or the tension in that? My synopsis and, and quick summary of, of his 
book, and, and essentially his answer to that question is this. He, he, he landed on the conclusion that hell is both a present reality for those who resist God in this life and reject his love, and it's a future reality for those who die unready for God's love. But, according to Rob Bell, but hell is not forever. Because since it's God's desire, 2 Peter 3, 9, that none perish, but that all would come to repentance. And since God gets his way, and since the greatest of God's attributes is love, in the end, love wins and God saves everyone. Every sinner, even after they die, turns to God and realizes that they've already been reconciled to God. But he concluded there would be no eternal hell, no conscious punishment for anyone, that God would not pour out his wrath on sinners who reject him and his Savior Jesus Christ because in the end, love wins. God is love and love wins. And so you get it, right? That Rob Bell's argument was that all would be saved. If not in this life, then after they die. You could call it a post-mortem salvation because in the end love wins doctrinally you would call it universalism right the doctrinal belief that all souls will be saved but if you play that out in practical ways it's the idea that ultimately that all roads lead to god that all religions ultimately lead to god because god is ultimately going to save everyone and by the way, if you don't know, this, this idea and belief is growing right now, again, among uh, modern-day Christians. And again, being honest, I understand the tension. I don't want anyone suffering misery and torment for, for eternity. And, and I can see, if you're not careful, you know, some of what's fueling its popularity. It's not just that people want to create their own truth. People look at God in the Old Testament and see his wrath poured out on sin and against his enemies, and then get to the New Testament and cherry-pick what Jesus taught, the, the love and the compassion and the tolerance and, and the no judgment, or so they think, because they're selectively choosing what to believe. It, it's almost like God grew up in the New Testament. He became fully mature, and, and, and so he turned off his wrath. And, and the God of today, the Jesus of today at least, is meek and mild. Do you realize that Jesus talked more of God's judgment and of hell than anyone else in the Bible? In fact, he spoke more of hell than all of the other authors of the Bible combined. Let me give you some, some words that he called us, some references he made. He referred to hell as the place of outer darkness, where there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He also referred to hell as fiery furnace, where lawbreakers will be thrown into at the end of the age when he returns. He called it the hell of fire, the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels and those who reject him. He called it the unquenchable fire, and maybe the most disturbing description of all, in Matthew 25, he called it eternal punishment. So you get the picture, this stark contrast between eternal life and, and, and the joy and, and the presence of God and, and goodness and delight and, and, and forever, you know, good and, and joy versus eternal punishment, which would be a never-ending experience of misery under God's wrath. Church, listen, the message of Scripture and the message of the gospel is clear. Indeed, God is love, a love like no other love will ever know. But also God is holy, and he is righteous, and he judges sin, all sin in all people. Christ's death on the cross was God's wrath being poured out on the judgment of sin. It's just that he was pouring out upon himself. It was love and justice to pay the debt for sin. 
And Jesus is the one. He is the way. He is the Savior who offers the only rescue from hell. And until something is done about one's sin, until it is forgiven by Jesus and his work on the cross, then for all of eternity, hell awaits the sinner. And listen, we can't make our own truth up about God because we want God to be the way we want him to be or because we don't like it or we think it's unfair or it's uncomfortable. This is a topic, this is a subject and a reality that we want to be right on. So we should take God at his word. Now, we've spent the past six weeks mainly in Revelation 21 and 22. All right, so this time, if you're looking on in a Bible, turn to Revelation 20, the chapter before those. There the events are recorded that happened just before the new heaven and the new earth and God dwelling on the resurrected earth with his resurrected people. When you get to Revelation 20, the millennial reign of Christ, thousand-year reign of Christ upon the earth is getting ready to come to its end. And this event happens just before the new heaven and the new earth. So Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 7, John saw it and wrote this. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And I realized, I realized the risk I'm taking. I just read that verse, and that's like, oh, what, what, what is all that? Yeah, it's a whole other series. Maybe another day. Not today, though, right? And verse 9, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. So this is Satan's final hurrah. This is an assault on God and an assault on his people, uh, and an assault on Jerusalem. And it is led by Satan and accompanied by all those who still choose rebellion against God, even after 10 centuries of peace upon the earth. But God stops him. And then this happens, verse 10. And the devil, this is Satan, who had deceived them, was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were. And they were tormented day and night forever and ever. So at this moment, Satan and, and, and all the fallen demonic angels are, are removed from creation for, forever. And, and, and it says they are cast into, and we looked at this in an earlier message. I think it was message number two. They're cast into the eternal hell, the lake of fire, where, note, they are tormented day and night forever and ever. John goes on, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne in him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. Now, just pause for a moment. Remember in message number two, I think it again it was, that we talked about the two judgments that every person will face. We, the first occurs when we die, the judgment of faith. It determines whether we go to, to heaven, the intermediate heaven, or we go to hell, the, the intermediate or now hell. And then, though, there's a second judgment. It is the judgment of, of works, and this is a description of that judgment for the lost. It's different for the believer. We mentioned that, that for the Christian, it's the Bema seat of Christ. There we give an account of our lives and we receive rewards for, for uh, eternity and the new earth. But there's a different judgment for the unsaved. And we call it this. It's the great white throne judgment. And Jesus sits upon the throne and judges the unsaved according to their works. And then look next, verse 13. And the sea gave up 
the dead who were in it. We talked about that. People who drowned at sea, uh, uh, people who were who were blown to bits in a bomb or, or, or some kind of catastrophe, but, but the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades, Hades being the, the now hell, the intermediate hell, gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. So again, I, I, I just want to just reiterate it one more time. Remember, the big revelation of, of, of Revelation 21 and 22 is that there is an immediate heaven now, a, a, a now heaven, the one where if you tell your grandkids grandma's in heaven, the one that she's in now, but the now heaven is not forever. It comes to the earth and there's a new earth and that's what the last six weeks have been about. Well, the same is true with the now hell, the intermediate hell. In the Old Testament, it's called the, the, the it's called Sheol, or the abode of the dead. In the New Testament, it's called Hades. So when you say, oh, well, Uncle Joe was an atheist, he died and went to hell. Well, this he, he's, in the, he's in the now hell now, but, but, but this is the moment where Joe is, is judged by Jesus according to his works. The books are opened and Joe is judged for what he has done, and he is declared condemned for eternity by Jesus. Church, everyone who dies or died without knowing Jesus, who lived their life in rebellion to God, will stand before Jesus at the great white throne judgment and be judged by him against God's perfect, holy standard. And then John goes on. He sees more. Verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, the eternal hell. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he too, she too, was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the eternal hell. You've heard people say, hey, judgment day is coming. This is the description of judgment day. Jesus referred to it in John 5. He said, a time is coming when those who are in their graves will hear his voice and they will come out. And those who have done what is good will rise to live and those who've done what is evil will rise to be condemned. We've seen, as we've seen in this series, what a contrast. God offers the gift of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, in sharp contrast to life forever on the new earth, hell is life forever in the lake of fire. Heaven is life in the presence of God. Hell is life in the absence of God and in the presence of Satan and his demons. Eternal life is on the new earth in the absence of sin and its curse. And hell is eternity in the presence of sin, without joy, without pleasure, but instead filled with misery and torment, and both are eternal and forever. It's a big deal. This is a really big deal. And I think if maybe we could come away from this series of messages and this message today with maybe with a, a few need to knows, I call them. Let me, let's talk about five of them. I think we'd be doing well. Five need to knows about hell. Number one, I think this first one goes without saying, but we need to say it anyway. Number one, be sure you understand that hell is not, I'm, I'm sorry, hell is the default destination of mankind. Heaven is not anyone's default destination. We're not all headed to heaven and somehow mess it up. No one goes to heaven automatically. No one is without sin. No one can meet God's holy standard on their own. Sin separates man from God in this life and for eternity. And unless our sin problem is resolved, everyone's default destination is hell. And judging by what's said at most funerals that you, that you probably go to, you'd think nearly everyone's going to heaven, wouldn't you? But Jesus made it really clear that most people are not going to heaven. He said, small is the gate and narrow is the way to life, and very few find it. 
Hell will be inhabited by people who ignored, rejected, or pretended God's invitation to salvation through Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, writing in the book of Romans, in Romans 2, he writes this. He says, Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them for yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath or yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. That day of wrath that Paul is speaking of there is the great white throne judgment of God. And Paul's reference to storing up wrath for yourself is simply acknowledging that our lives consist of sin and that God has promised his holy judgment against all sin. And so a lifetime of sin upon sin upon sin is just building up God's wrath against man. And John told us that God keeps records. Books were open. You know, it is so key to know the truth. And the truth that God reveals is that hell is the destination of all unless something is done about their sin. And of course, we know that God's answer to our sin is Jesus and his work on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. It is faith in him that saves us from hell and to heaven. The second need to know, this is really important, it's, this helps us because it helps us to know that, <clears throat> that hell is real because God is holy. Hell is real because God is holy. Hell is what, <clears throat> hell is what it is because the holiness of God is what it is. Hell should make our mouths just fall open, agape at the righteousness and the just holiness of God. It should make us tremble in, in before his majesty and his grandeur. We talked last Sunday in, in that message about seeing God face to face and how now in our sinful condition, no one would be able to survive in the presence of God because of his holiness. But because we don't like hell or don't want to talk about it or try to do away with it, we, we only do away with the reality of God's holiness and his perfect justice. God will judge all sin. And he will never, he cannot compromise his holiness. Rob Bell was only part right. In the end, love does win. But love does not win at the expense of the holiness of God. God doesn't give, have to give up one attribute to exercise another. And, and maybe you've heard it said, or maybe you're the one who says it. Well, God doesn't send people to hell. People send themselves to hell. That's only as true as God has provided a way of escape for his wrath and his judgment. He allowed Jesus to take the punishment for our sins and offer us salvation. But as Christians, we need to understand that God does send people to hell. That yes, he is loving, but he is holy and he is just. And his clear stated penalty for sin is eternal judgment in hell. And listen, be careful. As a 21st century Christian, it is not civilized and it is not loving, nor is it humane to deny the existence of an eternal hell or God's holiness to judge people condemned. To do that is nothing more than arrogance. That we as the created would dare to take what we think is the moral high ground over God in opposition to what God the creator has clearly revealed. You know what should shock us more? You know what should make us more uncomfortable and seem more unbelievable? Is, is not that some people could go to hell but that anyone would be permitted into heaven. That is the one that should blow our minds. God is that holy 
We are simply that undeserving and disqualified from saying that holy God cannot demand everlasting punishment. His holiness demands it, and it is only by God's loving grace that we can escape his wrath too, only by the blood of Jesus. A third need to know is that hell is eternal punishment. Hell is eternal punishment. It's both of those, eternal and punishment. People who die without Christ are not annihilated. They don't just go away. God is clear. Jesus was crystal clear in his teaching that in the same way that eternal life is life forever, in the joy and delight of the Lord and of heaven, hell too is life forever. In the separ separated from God and in misery and torment. Hell is both eternal and it is punishment. There's a, there, there's a shocking passage of Scripture in, in Matthew chapter 25. Jesus is teaching about God's final judgment. It's the one that John saw and wrote of in, Matthew, in, in Revelation 20. One, uh, 20. And, he, and Jesus speaks of how people are, it's, 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 uh, it's imagery and truth, but he speaks of how people before, before God are divided into two groups, like a shepherd would divide sheep and goats. And sitting on the white throne of judgment is Jesus, King Jesus. And picking up Matthew 25, picking up in verse 31, Jesus says this, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. By the way, that is heaven. That is the place and the condition that we've studied for the past six weeks. But then, verse 41, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you curse it, into the, into the what? Into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So notice Jesus saying that hell is a place prepared for the devil and his angels. I mean, where else would Satan spend eternity? It is a place originally prepared for the devil, not for people. There is a way of escape. But again, many, if not most, will be judged by God and spend their eternity in the same place as Satan. And Jesus adds, verse 46, and those, or, or, and these, and these will cast into the lake of fire, will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Hell is eternal. Those who go there are alive. They are conscious, and their punishment is forever. Listen, church, hell is not what a lot of people think it is. It is not a lounge with soft music, and folks sitting around having a good time sharing drinks. That's heaven. That's eternal life on the new earth. Writing in 2 Thessalonians, Paul, 2 Thessalonians 1.9, uh, Paul said, They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. And again there, the word destruction doesn't mean to be annihilated. It's the idea of the absence of all that is good, all that is life-giving. It, it, is, it, it is a disastrous existence. So we need to be sure that hell is eternal punishment. A fourth, fourth thing we need to know, take away, is that hell demonstrates the extent of God's love in saving us. Hell demonstrates the extent to which God went to prove his love to save us. Why do you suppose Jesus spoke more about hell than anyone else in the Bible? I think it's because he wanted us to see he was going to, what he was going to endure on the cross in order to save us from judgment. 
Jesus' punishment is hard to imagine if you really think about it. His bloody, disfigured body nailed to a cross, no doubt a recycled cross that was already stained with the blood and the feces and the urine of others who had been crucified before him, hanging there dying justly or unjustly just for us and crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he was taking our deserved hell onto his undeserving body that through faith in him, we could be saved. Hell is the absence of God's love, but it should magnify God's love for us, showing us how far God went and what he went through to offer rebellious people forgiveness of their sins and salvation into relationship with him. And then just one final piece, one final takeaway. Number five, hell is avoidable. It's avoidable. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him would not perish, would not spend eternity in hell, but be given the gift of eternal life. People go to hell because they rebel against God and commit sins against him and then never repent of them. Never repent of them the way God wants them to. And they refuse to accept Jesus as the payment for their sins. But those who do turn to him and see his love and mercy and grace that he offers, he saves them. How about you? Are you among the saved today? God's salvation from his judgment and hell is Jesus Christ. According to Jesus, no one comes to the Father except through me. Paul, writing in the book of Acts, in Acts 4.12, one of my all-time favorite verses, says this, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Saved, saved from what? From hell. Saved to what? To eternal life in heaven. Or as we have seen, to a redeemed, resurrected earth in resurrection bodies, in the presence of the Father, Son, and Spirit, and in the absence of sin and its curse, and for all of eternity. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about this. I mean, doesn't a true picture of heaven and the true reality of hell, shouldn't it motivate us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with other people? I mean, shouldn't it, shouldn't it make us want to surrender our lives to God and forsake our rebellion and sin against him? Shouldn't it motivate us to, to have churches that are set on the mission of the king and his kingdom and not focused on babysitting the saints and, and holding on to our petty preferences? It's just such nonsense when you think of it in the reality of heaven and the reality of hell. Those things should fall away in light of those truths because every person will spend eternity in one or the other, heaven or hell. I'll tell you what, by the grace of God, I'll stand with Joshua of the Old Testament who near his death challenged God's people about their futures. And he said this, he said, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's bow for prayer. Just a moment with your heads bowed, your eyes closed. You, 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 know, you know, Jesus asked a haunting question to a group of people one day during his time on the earth. He asked, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and yet forfeited his soul? And before they could answer, he followed it up with the question, for what can a man give in exchange for his soul? The answers to both those questions are nothing. But there's no good answer to either question. Jesus came to introduce God's kingdom and to show a better way. But more than that, he came to offer his life to save us from hell to heaven. Eternal life, it is a gift 
just like every other gift you've ever been given. Because you know good until it's received and open and they're made in the universe. If you're not saved from hell to God and eternal life, you can't be. Christ invites you into relationship with him to take that work that he did on the cross for you and his resurrection from the dead for you to be saved by faith in him, trust in him, surrender to him from hell unto heaven. If you are a person today who is saved, you should rejoice. You should sell out to Jesus. You should tell the world about it. You should be willing to pay any cost he asks. That because he, heaven, infinite. Father, thank you for your salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, that you have provided the, the solution. You have overcome, you have conquered the enemies that no man escapes from. Death, hell, grave, this eternal separation from you and punishment, all through Christ, cross, and then resurrection from the dead. So, Lord, this group of people in this place today, online, God, as we have this, this moment of responding to your training, drive this truth deeply into our hearts. What would it profit someone if they gave the whole world but spend eternity in hell? What could someone exchange for their soul? There's not. For God, you have offered the Savior Jesus Christ to send us. So today, may the lost in this room turn to Christ and be saved. May the saved turn to Christ today and rejoice in their salvation. Work a work in our hearts over the next few moments. And all I to do. We give you this time of response, of invitation. And we do it in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen.